Alrighty, this is part four of the Callahan reading. Let's jump right in. Page 92. Uh, Joe, and the nurses too. Nobody would ever believe that there's something about these energies, particularly if you take and set it in the sun. And one thing about them that you told me is you wash them in seawater. Now, I'm not talking processed salt, sea salt, Phil, sea salt. Health food store has sea salt. Joe, and something I found out when you put seaweed with it, you take and pulverize the seaweed. There's something about the kelp with the iodine and a couple other things with it. Phil, seaweed is the best. And of course, the Irish farmers would get it from the coast where it was, break it up and dry it out, then spread it out on their fields. Joe, seaweed mixes great with when you sonically grind it and mix it with iron oxide and lignites. You can't believe the way it's grown. The way, it's, the way it grows. Phil, it's all common sense. The ancient people knew all this. Joe, seaweed works best without being washed. Don't ever wash the salt off of it. Leave the salt right on it. Phil, you leave the seaweed alone. It's common sense is all it is. Joe, Explain the sonic grounding I'm doing with it. I'm doing it with. Phil, well, you're not actually touching it with something like a hammer. You're getting more pure iron than you need. When the iron comes off the hammer or whatever is used to pulverize the iron oxide, molecules come off the metal head and contaminate the magnetite, making it too strong. When you use ultrasonics, you're not touching or upsetting anything. The, mat the material stays more natural. Stick with nature. Joe. You're saying, uh, you're staying with nature. Staying with balance. Phil. That bird you hear chirping is not the chirping. It's the ultrasonics it's putting out to me. But I don't talk in ultrasonics. So the bird's wondering why I don't talk back. When I go in there and run the water from the faucet, the water passing over the iron from within the pipes puts out ultrasonics and the bird will start talking like mad joe now if you took a crystal like a bowl with crystals there and put water over there over it it would intensify the sound phil it would intensify the ultrasonics and the bird will start talking to you it's not the sonics a bird pays attention to it's the ultrasonics joe when you take these iron oxides the fe304 particularly the high gauss CGS of 19,000 uh, and sprinkle a little around where people have sprayed for insects. What's happening? Phil, well, what happens is the good stuff happens. In other words, God has created the earth, so there's good and the bad. The bad is the insects that don't belong there, and the good are the parasites and predators that eat off the insects which destroy your crop. So, actually, you want them because they're the good insects. When you put down paramagnetism, you will attract the good insects and repel the bad ones. That's the way God designed it. I don't know why. It just seems the way God designed, designed it that way. The bad insects just disappear. If you take what, like, I got near my window sill. Phil gets up from his chair and moves towards his window. Joe, what are you looking for? Phil, I had one there, this little rock. I just put an antenna on it. Joe, Oh, look at that, Marilyn. I pick these up every time I go to the store because I put paramagnetic soil on them, but I don't. But I didn't put an antenna on it. See, I learn something every time I come. Phil. Phil takes the plastic cup off of a three-inch long white prescription light container. This is paramagnetic rock with a nail in it. Joe. See, Marilyn? The nail or the screw goes right down through it, and it's got an antenna on top. Phil. The antenna makes it about 10 times stronger. Joe, now, the guy would take this and fill it with iron oxide, the Fe304, and put it around anywhere you need to diffuse weak magnetic fields. Phil, you can put this in your room and you'll never get sick. Joe, you put that by a TV or anywhere you have radiation. Phil, you put that by the TV and that's the end of the bad radiation. That's very interesting here, this picture that they have here. Winnie, but it also keeps the ants out. Joe, 
Would it be better with copper or just regular steel? Phil. Copper or anything. It doesn't matter. Marilyn. It also keeps the ants out, you said too. Phil. I've never seen an ant. Winnie. Ants don't come in anymore, even at the door. Joe. Marilyn's got them all over the house. I can see that now. Phil. All you gotta do is go out and get pieces of paramagnetic rock or granite or basalt. Whatever you put a nail with it. Uh, whatever. And put a nail with it. You don't need the antenna on it. I just put it there to pick up the container. Joe. Now, I put crystals in with iron oxide and I put these together. Phil. That'd make it even better. Joe. And what about when you squeeze it, put a little pressure on it? Phil. When you put pressure on it, it's called piezoelectric effect and it gets stronger. Piezoelectric effect generates electricity, so you're putting energy into it. It's like an electric generator, like a motor. It even drives insects away from 10 yards off. Joe. Those little balls I made over there, I could actually put a pin in them or do it else to make an antenna on them. Phil. Yeah, an ordinary straight pin. Uh, Joe. In the hyperbaric chamber with sodium silicate. That's quartz crystals, isn't it? Phil. You, you just drive a stainless steel pin in it and it becomes 10 times stronger. We don't put these, we don't put those sugar ants anymore because it's too strong. They don't like to go anywhere that's high paramagnetism and keep away from it. But if you go out to the harvester uh, anthill, they cut the leaves so you can get it with, so you can get them down and the leaves slowly ferment of which they feed from. If you go to the harvester anthill, you'll notice the mound is white and pink. The ants bring quartz and pink granite pebbles ant by ant and cover the whole anthill with the stones. So you've got a paramagnetic and diamagnetic hood over the cone of the mound. It's a paramagnetic layer that covers the anthill. If you go out here and about half a mile, there's a harvester anthill. And if you look at it, it's, a, it's white and pink. It's just common sense. Ask yourself, what does the ant do? Joe, you just had a good thing there. A blue bottle with a couple energy balls. Put it in the sun. Phil, in the sun. Joe, and drink the water. Uh, Phil, and drink the water and you'll never get sick. You put these around the house and never get a cold. Whatever you call a cold. <laughs> Joe, now what if you took one of these, one of those metallic Mobiuses that Tesla was talking about? There's a big truck out, outside of my house now, and of course my dogs are gonna bark. Hope they don't. Let me keep talking so that my dogs don't bark. Um, Mobius is uh, Tesla was talking about, for instance, uh, that was made out of an audio tape, audio video tape. You put a Mobius inside that and tap it with a nail. Is that what you're talking about? Phil, if you make it counterclockwise, it'll be good. But if it's clockwise, it'll probably ruin you. Joe, counterclockwise. Phil, counterclockwise, yes. Joe, that's exactly what Tesla said. To the left, always to the left. Phil, the Irish people for centuries, they don't know it. They don't do it anymore. I don't know why, but if you took a church like the one at Knock where the statue is from, which is a, as, which is a paramagnetic limestone church, they would warn you to never walk around it clockwise. They walked around it counterclockwise. Never walk clockwise because it would make you feel sick. It still does. If you walk around the church clockwise. <laughs> I did it one time to see and ended up sick to my stomach. I was throwing up all night. Joe. The Indians have these medicine wheels and they always go to the left. Nobody, Nobody's ever understood this. If you go, If you take a Mobius and turn it upside down, it should be the opposite, but it isn't. Phil, no, because it's got a 180 degree twist in it. It's got no one side to it because it's an infinite loop. Joe, there's no up or down on it. When you drill a hole in a Mobius, where does the energy go from? Phil, the energy probably separates and goes around the hole. Some of it might fall in the hole like a hole in a water pipe. Not much though because the energy is too fast. Just like water goes around a hole in a fast stream, it doesn't go down except for some. Joe, if you were to wrap one of these as a capacitor with a gold foil, would that intensify it? Phil, yeah. If you wrapped it, if you wrapped it to the left, if you wrapped it to the right, it'll probably make you sick. If it's counterclockwise, it probably cancel the effect of being sick uh, from one that was wrapped clockwise. Joe, the mind. You're doing this with your mind, and the fact that your mind is doing it to the left 
Do you think the human mind has something to do with the energizing aspect? Phil, doctors know that, that your left mind is your thinking side. Your left side of the brain is the side of that reasons. The right side is the one for language. Your right side memorizes like for language and your uh, left side reasons. They've known that for a hundred years. Tesla said that. He realized he was thinking with the left side of his brain. Joe, I gave you one piece of paper there. I saw Sid's paper on that. He quoted me on it. Tesla said that the only way we could protect ourselves from detrimental magnetic fields was to use a metallic Mobius wound to the left. Phil, everything in nature that works is assigned counterclockwise. Once you go against the nature of the sun, it, beca it becomes excess energy. You can't handle it, so you make sure it goes on the left of the brain there. Joe, these little things can be tested so easily, using birds, for example. Phil, the reason why people are so sensitive is because they have an excess on the left side of the brain. Marilyn, I have a question about direction. Is that also true south of the equator? Phil, there's a big debate going on uh, now, and the way I, every time I fly south of the equator, which isn't anymore, I don't know if the airplane was canceling it, but I didn't get any real difference. Except one time, I was in the jungles of the equator. Uh, I got the impression. I didn't stay there long, and I didn't have my CGS meter with me either, so I couldn't make sure. But I got the impression, if you stayed at the equator, if you went around in the cl in clockwise circles, you'd get sick. I didn't stay there uh, long enough, but I had the impression I didn't feel as good. Joe, I'll have to check that one out, Marilyn. But if you went south of the equator... Phil, south of the equator, it's the opposite. Marilyn, so south of the equator, you'd want to go around the church clockwise. Phil, uh, clockwise. Yeah, right. Marilyn, okay, that's what I was wondering. Joe, on our 40th anniversary, our kids gave us a boat, and we got down to the point where the boat was using seaweed to flush the toilets. I went in there to use the toilets, and when I flushed, it went the wrong way. So I spent an hour sitting there looking at it flush. I got myself a bottle of booze and watched it go round and round. I thought I'd lost my marbles. Phil, you gotta be careful because of the natives and headhunters south of the equator. Or the or of the equator. <laughs> I had a hard time trying to explain to them, but they wanted to do the opposite of what I was talking about. I finally got to the point. Robin or Raymond. I can't think of his name at the moment. Robin was a scientist. Raymond was a famous sh uh, shaman among the headhunters. He was a friend of mine, and probably the funniest part of it was I had a Cessna 250, and the pilot was a major in the Peruvian Air Force. I was a co-pilot, of course, and the shaman wanted to fly. So we got him in the plane, but when it started, he was terrified. He got in the back seat and huddled there, and we finally had to land him in a cow pasture. We thought he was going to die. He was so afraid of that thing. He wanted to be in it so bad, but when we had to land in a clearing and let him out, laughs, he said he'd rather walk back home, and he did all laugh. He had about a 20-mile walk. Wow. Joe. Bert told me at one time that he was talking about some people, the Indians, that there'd be Spanish boats that would come into the harbor. The Indians would look at them but couldn't see them. They never had anything to relate to the boat, so they couldn't see it. Not until they took them out on a boat littler that than that and take them to the ship, and after that, they could see it. Phil, that happened to me with birds. Some birds you can't relate to because you really don't like them. Sitting, sitting, right there, sitting right in front of them, and you can't really see them. Bird watchers sometimes tell me, How come you always see a hawk, but you never see hawks? Well, because subconsciously... You don't like hawks because hawks kill other birds, so you don't see them. But I can see a hawk now in the corner of my eye. It can be a couple miles up in the air, and I'll still see it. Joe, I was down in Brazil one time, and there was a tree sitting on the plane, and it had these little and these beautiful leaves I've uh, ever seen in my life. They were fluorescent, so I took this Land Rover and drove over to it, uh, and I... Uh, and as I got near, all the leaves flew away. It was a dead tree. Something shocked the heck out of me. The leaves, the hell out of me. The leaves just blew away. Phil, the birds were sitting on it. They love those trees. Hawks always pick on that tree. I used to 
I used to when I was younger, about 16 or 17, I would hardly uh, look, ever look for hawk nests. I'd just get a little white mouse and put him in a wire cage and make a hundred loops around, uh, make a hundred loops, uh, loops using wire. A wild hawk would come down to get the mouse and get caught in the wire loops. I'd take the hawk and tame it. Most people never get them tamed, but I can, but I can in three days. I would I could take a hawk and it would be a perfectly wild one. Sometimes you'd lose them because they get out of sight and you couldn't find them. I'd never bother with looking for the nests. I'd trap them in Ireland and just train them. I'd trap kestrels, but I didn't want to hunt birds anyway. I'd trap rats and mice instead. Kestrels hunt r rats and mice. There's a book around here in English a friend of mine wrote. I was just reading it this morning. It's somewhere here near the couch. There it is. Lure of the Falcon. Joe, I read your books. I think I know everything. I know about your books, but I read them cover uh, I read them over and over and there's always something that I miss that I always pass by. I'll pick up something after the 10th or 12th time or whatever. There's something there that wasn't there before. Phil, that's why I write them. A lot of people inter are a lot of people interested in nature. They love my books. They buy them. Acres can't quit printing them. Joe, I wish the old man's eyes would get a little bright, a little a little bit better. Phil, yeah, that's a shame. Chuck Walters is a genius in agriculture, an agricultural genius if there ever was one. Joe, I hadn't seen seen him in a little bit, and I was up there. I can't. It's just hard to believe he's going blind. Phil, I tried to tell him to use a little paramagnetic rock in his orange juice. I don't know why people don't listen. I told him, if you put a little ground-up paramagnetic rock in your orange juice, it'll probably cure you. He never did. Joe, oh, what if I took a quartz tube, like a test tube, with paramagnetic 19,000 CGS and even seal it at the top and put, put that in there? Would the vibrational frequencies go through quartz? Phil, I usually put it in a plastic tube, but quartz would be a lot better. Plastic is diamagnetic and quartz would be a stronger would be stronger and you wouldn't need a nail anymore. It would be just too strong and you wouldn't need a nail. It'd be so powerful it could cure everything. Joe, if you took a copper coil in there and coiled it to the left and put it up there, up like an antenna, Phil, it would make a it would make it a little better. Probably make it an eighth or a quarter better. Joe, silver or gold? Phil, silver or gold would make it a little better, but a quarter or but a quarter or stronger. Oh, buy a quarter or stronger. Joe, if you put a little pressure on the crystals, Phil, it would make it better. Clamp it using a little pressure, not a lot. You'd have a powerful healing device. Joe, we're talking about several different energies, aren't we? Phil, that's piezoelectric energy there. You can imagine piezoelectric and infrared energy. All transistors work that way. Transistors are piezoelectric, so that's the transmitter. And what comes out is electrical energy as a radio wave. That's what works in an airplane. You talk about a vacuum. If you stop to think mathematically, using a little integrated calculus, the vacuum, the plane, couldn't possibly get off the ground. The plane is so heavy and the vacuum is so weak it wouldn't work. That's what... That's what's in all the books. The electrical and aeronautical en engineers say it can't work because there's not enough energy. And I'd say, well, look at this. And I plugged in some calculus formula on the board to show how it works. The airplane is made out of aluminum and the si skin of the plane is cloth. That's diamagnetic. And oxygen is paramagnetic. Then the whole thing lifts off. Then the whole thing lifts. And that's the same thing that Victor Schoberger talked about. Uh, increase. Uh, nah, let, let me not <laughs> speak because uh, I haven't read his books yet. Joe, what if you put little scales like on fish, Phil? That's why the fish can move upstream. Of course, yes, this is, they're getting into it now. That's why the fish can move upstream. They use paramagnetic and diamagnetic energies. Joe, what if you put some uh, on a model airplane, Phil? Well, they'd probably levitate in the air. The fish would flow above the tank and they wouldn't stay in the water. Joe and Phil laugh as Phil demonstrates with his hands what it would look like. I did that once, not with fish, but I did that with a big with a bug once. I took a needle and generated a paramagnetic force on the bottom and a diamagnetic force above it, and it floated in the air. 
an entomologist came along and said, well, it's flying. Well, beetles are heavy. Well, beetles are heavy because they have the, the heavy wing covers, elytra. Well, it can't be flying, they say. It's too heavy. It can't be floating in the air like that. Yep, the two wings, elytra. Cool. Joe. Well, they said that a June bug or a bumblebee can't fly aer aeronautically. That's impossible. Phil. They don't know about paramagnetism and diamagnetism. Joe. You think that's why the June bug and the bumblebee can fly? Phil. The oxygen is paramagnetic and the June bug and all insects are mostly water just like people. You're mostly diamagnetic because of the water. I couldn't even measure the paramagnetism in your body because you're mostly water and that's diamagnetic. I could measure the diamagnetism real easy, but it's really but it's hard to measure the paramagnetics because there's so little of there's so little of it. You're about 98% water, so there's just a trace of paramagnetism in your body. Joe, what energy are the are these dowsers tapping into? Is it paramagnetics? Phil, yeah, it's paramagnetics. They take a quartz crystal on a string and can tell because your body oscillates back and forth from diamagnetism to paramagnetism. It just goes around in circles. Joe, now, Walter Gurniak, you met him from Cornell. He died this year. He told me that if you take a cotton cloth or a silk string and cover it with beeswax, Phil, sure, the cotton string is paramagnetic and the beeswax is the magic substance. Beeswax oscillates from paramagnet paramagnetic to diamagnetic states. So pretty soon it starts to twirl around in circles. Oh, that's interesting. Joe, it's a hermaphrodite, so it goes both ways. Phil, it goes both ways. So so is your body. It oscillates back and forth. One second it's diamagnetic and the next it's paramagnetic. Joe, that's life, life in balance. Phil. In your body, if your body goes totally diamagnetic, you're dead. Joe, you knew Coates Perth and the psychic Thelma Moss, who did that work for psychic discoveries behind the curtain wall, uh, the Iron Curtain. <laughs> well, Coates has come out with a new film in the theater. Let's see if I can get you a copy of it and mail it to you. What the heck was the name? What do we know? What the hell do we know? Marilyn, what the bleep do we know? Joe. What the bleep do we know? And in there, and in it, there are, is a lot of people. It's very good. And they're talking about things we're talking about. Winnie. Oh, that sounds interesting. Joe. You knew Colts up in the UCLA? I remember her in the lab. She carried her baby around with her in her back like a papoose. She's a brilliant lady. I loved her. But I looked at her in this movie and she's old. I haven't looked in the mirror myself. Marilyn. There's a little story behind, uh, there's a little story built into this movie. She did a lot of interviews with these people all through the movie. Joe, I saw this movie and really enjoyed it. It's just that I knew a lot of people who were in it. Just thought I'd mention it because it really makes you stop and think. We really don't know much, Phil. I knew Edgar Casey really well. Oh, that's very interesting. Uh, I've been just... If you are curious about Edgar Casey, he's the psychic. Uh, look up dark, the Dark Journalist on YouTube. He covers a lot of interesting things uh, involving Edgar Casey. Very interesting stuff, Edgar Casey. Pretty cool that he's talking about it now. What a coincidence! Every day I listen to things like this. Okay, Phil, I knew Edgar Casey real well. It's cool that he knew him very well too. He was the happiest man in the world because everybody would badmouth him and everything else until I came along and explained it all to him. Then they stopped bad-mouthing him. He used all the all this stuff, but didn't know how it worked until I explained until I explained it. Joe, he got that from dreams. I never met him, but I met his son. He's got a clinic in Arizona and on 40th and Indian School, and they treat people for cancer and all this other stuff. He's got a couple of medical doctors, Mr. and Mrs. Grady. I took my mother up there uh, before she died. Phil. He wanted to save the black forest, the black forest, because it was non-linear. Well, it wasn't a mixture of bushes and trees and plants, therefore it got sicker and sicker. I was talking to Casey one time and he mentioned it to me. He asked about it and all I said was that I noticed about streams, was what I noticed about streams. Streams serpentine through the forest and all the fish are happy and all the bugs are happy and everybody's happy. 
so I suggested he make a big stream. He got tons of lumber and made a tough and made a tro. He collected snow water from the mountains and somewhere north of the forest and sent it down the tro, the tro through the black forest and it uh, recuperated. They give him the credit for it, uh, for saving the forest just by listening to me. Joe, now the mineral that's in the water that's grinding in the snow is where the diamagnetics is showing up. What about the people in Tibet and all, all up in there that drink? the glacier water, Phil. Same thing, Joe. You knew Betty Morales real well, Phil. I never met her, but I knew of her, Joe. Betty went over there and brought back a couple jugs of water. I got in trouble during World War II when the Russians was there. were there. I had them ship me water from all over, the rivers and spas, and I found magnesium sulfate of all things, and that was one thing that helped kill pain. I played with uh, water all my life. Phil, good water is built with chemicals that make it good. Joe, well, minerals rather than chemicals. Phil, yeah, minerals of all kinds um, are not. Uh, minerals of all kinds are not just chemicals. Good minerals are diamagnetic. A lot of diamagnetic minerals are good as well as sand, which is diamagnetic. So if you have the right kind of sand in a stream, you have tremendous relaxation. Joe, quartz is diamagnetic and iron is paramagnetic. Phil, anything that rusts, which is iron oxide, of course, is paramagnetic, and water is diamagnetic. Most of the rocks and rivers and streams are a mixture of the two. The smooth pebbles in the stream are diamagnetic, and the rough ones are paramagnetic. I always go to a stream and pick up a rock, and if it's smooth, it's diamagnetic, and if it's rough, it's paramagnetic. That's interesting. Joe, you said something that I always wondered about. You can't magnetize a ball, but you can but you can magnetize anything that's got points on it. Phil, anything that's rough, when you look at it under a microscope like those balls, there's a lot of points. It's like millions of antennas, so it's powerful. Joe, I found they're more powerful when I mix sapphides with it, when I grind them up. Now, why would sapphides be more powerful? Phil, well, sapphire, sorry about that. I'm not sure why I didn't read that right initially. Oh, okay, so it's spelled sapphires here and sapphire here. So, Well, sapphire is highly diamagnetic. It's probably a CGS of minus 200 instead of a, of, my, of a minus 70. So it's a very diamagnetic. The stronger it is paramagnetic and diamagnetic, the more powerful it is. If you use basalt, which is higher than pink granite for paramagnetism, it'd be even stronger. If you put a if you get up to 14,000, that's really strong. Basalt is about 14,000, which is really strong. Pink granite is only three or 4,000. Cool. Basalt is about 14,000. Joe, I mixed a pink, pink granite with, a ma with magnetite, and I'm getting about 19,000. Phil, pink granite is real good. Joe, Tesla said about this granite bed. He said, if you want to charge these purple plates, you have to put them on a bed of granite. Then you have to use Tesla coils, high electrical power, and leave them here for at least 24 hours. Phil, if you really want to charge something up, you have to put them, you have to put more electricity into it, store it, and then cut it off. It charges and gets stored. You can charge this up. Phil picks up the container with the paramagnetic rocks, snail, and antenna using a a race a racine racing the motor for a couple days and it'll be 10 times stronger let me take a sip of my water joe i had taken this iron oxide and put it on a band-aid and then on a fluorescent tube where the power is coming in and it doubles the life of the tube phil oh sure It'll double the life of anything. It'll double your life. If you die at 60, you won't live to 120. If you had paramagnetics around you, but you'd probably reach 90 or older. If you put these in your pocket, you'll never get sick. Birds. Uh, Joe. Birds can actually peck out the paramagnetic out of the soil and eat them. Phil. Yeah. Birds know all about that. Phil. Oh yeah, if you kill a chicken and open its crop, you'll find paramagnetic stones. Joe. Is this why birds like parrots have such long lifespans? Phil, yep. Joe, what about turtles? Is this why they have long lifespans? Phil, 
excuse me, the water is going in through their nostrils. That's why turtles are so long lived because they live in a paramagnetic environment. Unless it's polluted and then it, they die. It's not uncommon for a turtle to live over 100 years. I had a box turtle. My mother got tired of it to Winnie. Didn't we let it go? Winnie, you took it without telling her. <laughs> Phil, how about that? I forgot about my mother. She fell in love with that turtle. It was a tortoise, which is a land turtle. It wasn't. I wasn't even thinking of her. It probably lived to 150 years old. It's probably still out there in Gainesville. Winnie, no, we took it on the road with us. Phil, oh yeah, it's in a marsh somewhere in Texas. There's a lake somewhere. Winnie, we didn't tell her we were doing it. She forgot about it. Phil, I hoped she forgot about it. <laughs> Joe, I heard a joke one time about a fellow who sent his mother a parrot. He come home and says, where's the parrot? The mother says, why? He says, well, the parrot was a real special parrot. They understand six, six languages. And she says, well, I killed it for dinner and it didn't say anything. <laughs> That's funny. Phil, the natives in South America eat parrots all the time. You give, it a, you give a parrot to a South American and he'll be liable to cook it and eat it. They make real good eating. Joe, we went on a cruise and at this one place they had some iguanas and they had a deer on a string. I asked about it being fresh and they said... They don't have refrigerators. I said, okay, that's our food. That's dinner tomorrow. She was fascinated uh, with the people down there and how industri industrious they were. We went down to an adobe or an adobe. I think it's an adobe. I don't know. Uh, making place. Adobe like the software. I don't know. Making place. And the man there had a wheelbarrow uh, without a wheel. He just had a shovel and bring water in to make the bricks. It didn't take anything to make a living. Phil. I used to watch them make. Uh, I used to watch them making those things in Texas. I grew up in Tennessee, in Texas, actually. My grandmother lived in El Paso, so I spent all my summers there. I watched them make adobe in the summer. Joe, they used to bring us uh, clay and mix it. Water and mix it water and get it going real good. Then they'd. Uh, put a little water and then lay it over these women's legs, then shape it around the leg. Then they'd drill a hole and use a dull butter knife to cut it, to cut around it. And then they'd lift up, lift it up to lay, lay it over there. And they were making a tile for the roof. They'd have a skinny lady there and a heavy one over there. <laughs> Phil, different sizes, uh, different size tile for the roof. Joe. I was pretty young in those days, and I'd watch those girls. It was pretty unbelievable. They make the towel pretty close to the site. Winnie, didn't that hurt the leg? Joe, no, they put water in them, and they do that all day, one right after the other. Phil, it was making them hell healthy, too. They put all the paramagnetic clay on them. They never got sick. Joe, they'd stack it up all there and bring in dung and roots, anything that could burn and put it all on top of the tiles and bake them. Phil, I'd seen Indians do that in the jungles. The Indians would do all sorts of strange things. The shaman, too. I couldn't figure out what the shaman was doing. Joe, the thing with these people of the jungles was feast or famine. All the food uh, would come out at one time. All the fish would come out at one time. Uh, there were periods for the elite. They, they hang these fish up and it would be very humid. They built fires around and around it and tried to smoke it. Put the maggots, but the maggots would get in. And when you come in, you're a special person and they want to do something nice for you. And they pass out this rotten fish and you're supposed to eat it. I used to take this charcoal and eat it with the fish. And if you don't do uh, that with the, those people, Marilyn, you've offended them. Joe, you offend them. They done the, the, very, ve the very best for you. If they, get, if they get out of their bed uh, so you don't have to sleep on the ground, you better sleep on the bed, Phil. The Jewish people of Palestine had some kind of food. I guess you'd call it oatmeal or something. Uh, bruggle, they call it. God, I used to hate bruggle. I used to sneak it behind my back and put it in my back pocket. Joe, the one thing that would bother me was poggy. These old men would be chewing corn and then spit it into this pot. If you were a special person, they'd... They'd run it through a piece of cloth and 
uh, get some of that slime out of it. Oh, Jesus. But to drink that stuff after it was fermented, it would uh, fill. Yeah, the taste of it would be enough to kill you, Joe. It was enough to turn your stomach. Phil, yeah, it turned your stomach. I had to watch that in Israel. I'd have to sneak it into my back pocket. Joe, as long as you went along with these people and you'd done the same thing they do, you'd be fine. Phil, you're fine. You're fine. Joe, you could uh, get a dart. Phil, yeah, you got a poison. <laughs> you got a poison dart in your <laughs> dart in your in your back. They wouldn't think of anything but of killing you. That's for sure. They wouldn't think anything but of killing you. Okay, Joe, I think uh, one of these. I think uh, one of the things they can sense fear in a person, and they could also tell if you were sincere. If you had bad thoughts, they knew it. Phil, I lived with the headhunters for five years every summer. I spent five summers uh, down with the Ashari headhunters and got to know them real good. Joe, I got out of there real quick as I could. I got out of there as quick as I could. They're getting real men. They're getting real mean there because of these white people and these pro uh, prospectors and this other stuff coming down there. Phil, they were mean then because Ashari headhunters didn't have any use for anybody. I was the only one really ever to go there and live with them. They'd have no use for anyone. They'd kill you just as soon as looking at you. Most people go in there with a gun or a knife, even a pocket knife. I'd go in there totally unarmed and smiling. They'd look at me as if I was crazy, but then after a while they got to like me. Joe, people that are scary, people that are crazy, they treat them a lot better than they do with other people. <laughs> Phil, oh sure, they probably thought I was crazy. I'd come in there laughing and talking and smiling. I didn't have any weapons on me. I never had any trouble with them at all. Joe, they treat them like holy people, even though they were crazy. People that's got afflictions or something. Phil, I was real special to those people. I wrote a couple articles about them after the five years I spent with them. I could probably write a book about it now. There was one assistant shaman because cause I got so close to the shaman, he got jealous. He was afraid of me. And I knew he was afraid of me, so I didn't have anything to worry about from him. He thought I was a greater shaman than he than, than the shaman. He hated my guts, but he was afraid to get a poison dart in me. He could have killed me, uh, but he never did it. He probably thought that if he did, I'd come back as an eagle and kill him. They always had visions, because if you take this drug and that had, that they had, uh, Joe, peyote? Phil, it's like peyote, peyote. It comes from a tree instead of a cactus, and it's just like it, but it's a different name. They take that drug and got these visions. I took it one night. I never had visions. I just got sick to my stomach. I never took that again. Joe, well, we're facing some bad times. West uh, Nile disease and things like that. I think the dragonflies we killed with the sprays, things are out of balance. Phil, that's what I'm going to try and stop when I get there, when I get up there. It's a God thing for me to stop all that. When they give me the Congressional Medal of Honor, they're going to be forced to hear me. Forced to hear to me. To hear to me. Joe, when you start playing with nature and get things out of balance, now Rick and Sherry Herrera de Frey made a fortune and became very wealthy, raising ladybugs and raising little wasps and things like that. They saved the world, Phil. Sure, Joe. They sell them all over the world. They got a 10-acre facility on the backside of the Catalinas called Arbico Organics. I visit them once in a while. Uh, they're great uh, advocates of you. You wouldn't believe it. Your books are lined up on the shelves. Sherry and Rick sell these bugs all over the world. I'm going to go back to tell... I'm going to ba go back to them and try to... Try to them to get a hold of you and they'll probably call you they got this west nile and dragonflies would do that or phil they got the cure for it there for it right there uh, joe bats would be a good uh, joe uh phil the dragonflies would be easier to rear and let them go in the areas where the where there's problems with west nile virus joe how about mad cow disease that's another one uh that's getting to be real bad. I think it's a lot worse than we realize now. Phil, 
They can stop that immediately. That's just malnutrition in the cow, Winnie. I thought it was the feed, Phil. Well, it's in the feed because the feed's all chemical poisoning, Winnie. It's all bad, Joe. But if the cows had paramagnetics in the, in it, in the immune system, would be uh, taken care of, Phil. Um, let's stop here because I gotta work soon. One fifteen.